Most of the software I use day to day is open source, from my computer and server operating systems to most of my apps and what I actually run on my servers. Well, excluding on my phone, because most of the apps that you will run on a phone are proprietary, unfortunately. Maybe there's a video in there, we'll look at that in the future. So today we'll take a look at all the open source software I use on a daily basis for my personal life and for the channel. And this includes today's sponsor's application. This video is sponsored by Safings Portmaster. Portmaster is an all-in-one tool to easily take your privacy to the next level. And it's a tool I use myself on all of my Linux devices. Portmaster lets you automatically block all trackers and malware in every application you run on your computer. Not just your web browser, but everything you run. It's easy to use with defaults already in place that lets you just set it and forget it. But if you like to configure every rule and every app, you also can. Portmaster is completely free and open source and also free of charge, as it's funded by users that subscribe to the SPN, a super-powered VPN that gives you multiple identities for every connection of every application. So if you want to easily improve the privacy of your system, whatever the Linux distro you use, or even on Windows, click the link in the description below and download the Portmaster for free. So let's begin with the operating systems, the stuff that actually lets me use these computers. My laptop and my desktop run Fedora Workstation 38 with GNOME 44. I won't spend too much time on that. I have a dedicated video on my workflow for each of these devices and for the extensions I added. Suffice it to say, it's very stable, it's easy to use, it's perfect on a laptop with a touchpad, and it does everything I need it to. I might replace that with NixOS in the future, probably when Plasma 6 releases and is available in Nix. And if you're wondering why, it's because replicating my entire system with just one config file on any other computer is exactly what I need, as I very often test new devices and hardware. Now for my servers, I have one running Ubuntu 20.04 LTS. It's used for my next cloud server. It's hosted on Linode and it's the backbone of all my digital life and the channel. Why Ubuntu and why 20.04? Well, it was the LTS release when I created that server and I picked Ubuntu because installing Nextcloud as a snap is extremely easy with just one command line. Yes, I don't like snaps on the desktop, but for server stuff, man, are they easy. And yes, I am a lazy bastard. My other server is used to host my podcast, the Linux and open source news podcast. If you don't know, it's like the Linux and open source news videos that I make, but more detailed with more topics in audio format. The link is in the description. This server is hosted on Linode and it runs Debian 11 because 12 wasn't out yet when I created the server and because I like Debian and I'm familiar with how it works. I will generally also have a bunch of other distros that I run at any given time on spare laptops, but these are just for testing purposes. For what I use day to day, these are the operating systems that I use. Oh wait, I forgot, I also run Holo ISO on a PC in my living room that serves as my Linux gaming console. I also have a video about it if you want to see what I used and how well it runs. I will have to update my servers at some point to move to a more recent Ubuntu LTS or to Debian 12, but I will probably only do that when support ends or when it becomes impossible to apply updates to the software I run on these servers. So let's talk about exactly that, what I run on these servers. And yeah, don't worry, we'll talk about desktop apps in a minute. The first thing is Nextcloud. As I said, it is installed as a snap and it works beautifully. I don't get the updates as soon as Nextcloud publishes them, but when I do get them, they're very well tested and I've never had any issues with that. I'm currently on version 26.0.4, so Nextcloud Hub 4, not 5. I personally don't care about all the AI related stuff that Nextcloud added in Hub 5, so I'm not in a hurry to update, apart from the nerdy part of me that wants to use the latest thing all the time. I mostly use Nextcloud as the platform to handle all my online accounts. It hosts my calendars, contacts, tasks, photos, notes, RSS feeds, passwords, and I also use it to share files with sponsors or to share the link to the weekly patron cast I make for patrons and YouTube members. 
It is secured with an authentication app, passwords are end-to-end -end encrypted, and accessed through a browser extension. And generally, I don't use the web interface much. Everything is accessed through various desktop or mobile apps, which we will all cover in a minute. My other server hosts my podcast using Why You Know Host and their Castopod app. Why You Know Host is a very simple graphical dashboard to run one or multiple server applications. It basically just simplifies hosting stuff and it has pre-packaged apps to install stuff in one click. Do you notice a theme here? I'm lazy and I don't want to install stuff manually. Now the only app that runs on this thing is Castopod. It's a Fediverse enabled podcast platform that gives you a full website for your podcast, the RSS feed you need to publish it to other platforms, detailed anonymized statistics, and a lot of other features. And you get an admin dashboard to publish new episodes. It's really, really good. And it uses the ActivityPub standard, which means that you can follow the podcast, for example, on Mastodon and get each new episode as a post on your Mastodon app. Or soon you will be able to follow it on the Threads app from Meta. Just kidding, don't use that thing. Now to access these servers, I use SSH and the Black Box Terminal app. It's a relatively recent one for GNOME, but it looks good and it does what I need it to. Now to interact with Nextcloud related stuff, I use a few apps. The first one is IOTAS. It's a GTK application that plugs into Nextcloud Notes and lets you take, well, notes in simple distraction-free markdown. It doesn't have all the features the new Nextcloud Notes app has, like a what you see is what you get editor, but it's more than enough for me. For RSS feeds, I use Newsflash, which is another GTK app. They're actually going to release a new version soon, but the current one is great. Maybe I will move my RSS feeds into Thunderbird, but I sort of like having an app for each task as much as possible. True Unix philosophy here. I also, of course, use the Nextcloud desktop client to sync all my files to and from my computers, plus the Nautilus Nextcloud integration so I can generate a shared link for any file straight from the file manager. And I would really like this integration to work with the Flatpak version of the Nextcloud desktop client, but for now, it doesn't support it. For tasks, I use Endeavor. It's pretty basic, but it's enough for my needs, and it also syncs with Nextcloud tasks, so I can get these on any device I use. And on my phone, I also use the Nextcloud app to send all my photos automatically from my phone to a folder that is then synced to all my computers. And I use the official Nextcloud Notes app to have access to my scripts while I'm recording. Tasks are accessed through the Reminders app, contacts and calendars through the default apps of the phone as well. It is a very easy setup. It's just as convenient as using the Google or Apple's ecosystem, except you have to enter your login information into multiple apps because for some reason, some don't use the Nextcloud online accounts that I set up in GNOME. Now for what I use to make videos and the podcast, for audio, I use Audacity. It looks like crap, it's very old, but it does the trick. It has the three effects I need, a noise reduction tool, a compressor, and a normalizing tool. If you have simpler, more modern looking apps that do the same thing, I am open to suggestions. For editing videos, I used to use PTV and then Caden Live, but they were just too slow, they were not hardware accelerated, and Caden Live started crashing a lot, so I moved to Resolve, which unfortunately is not open source, so we will not talk about it here. For my thumbnails, it is obviously GIMP. It has a bad reputation among people who are familiar with Photoshop, but as I've never used that proprietary thing, GIMP is really easy to use for me. Although I'll freely admit that my thumbnails are far from being works of art, so maybe I'm the exception here. GIMP lets me handle layers, gradients, removing shapes from my usual white cutouts, place some text, draw some shadows or outlines. It's just very simple and I'm used to it. Is the name stupid? Yes. Does the program work? Also yes. And for recording my screen, it's OBS on every device. It's very powerful. It lets me record in a format Resolve can use. It uses my NVIDIA GPUs and NVENC to avoid completely destroying the CPU while I'm recording. It's just good. I don't use most of its features. I don't stream. I don't use plugins. But for basic recordings, it just works really well. And I also use a few utilities to make video editing a little bit easier. 
When I happen upon an image I want to use that uses a format Resolve doesn't support like WebP or AVIF, I use Converter to convert it to PNG. It's a simple GNOME utility that just converts images, either just one or multiple ones. For converting video files, I use FFmpeg in a terminal. I started using Handbrake for a while, but it was just too cluttered compared to the good old command line. And when I need to re-download one of my old videos that I didn't back up, I use Parabolic, previously Tube Downloader. You just paste the URL, set the quality and format, and it downloads it. It's easy as pie. And that's about it for video and audio production. I wish I could replace Resolve with an open source video editing tool, but for now I have yet to find one that suits my needs. Now for a few smaller utilities. For virtual machines, I generally run them using GNOME boxes because it's really simple, it automatically changes the resolution when you resize the window, and it just runs really well. I also use VirtualBox on my desktop because for some reason GNOME boxes stopped working there after an update. The create button for virtual machines stays grayed out all the time and I could not find a way to fix it on that computer. If you have a solution, I will gladly take it. I much prefer GNOME boxes to VirtualBox. For my backups, I use Pika Backup. It's a small tool, you can exclude files and folders, but it's just meant for personal file backups, not a whole system restoration. I don't use anything for that, but at least I have two backups of my personal files, one on Nextcloud and one on an external drive. I also use Safing Sportmaster, which you will know about if you listen to the sponsor segment of this video. I will not present it again. It's a wonderful open source tool to analyze the connections leaving your computer and even to toggle a system-wide tracker or ad blocker. For editing text, I generally just use Nano in a terminal. Time to let me know I should use Vim or Emacs instead, which I want. I love Nano, I'm a Nano guy, it's really great. For music, I use YTM music because I pay for YouTube Premium to avoid ads on my TV, and it comes with a music streaming service, so I might as well use it. The app itself is open source, but it's also just a wrapper for YouTube Music's website, which isn't open source as far as I know, so I'm not sure it counts. And now for productivity apps. I won't talk much about the web browser, it's Firefox everywhere, even on my phone. It's fast, it has all the extensions I want, I rarely happen upon a website that doesn't work with it, and I can theme it with this really nice Libadvita theme, so it looks like a GNOME app. I love it, it's the only browser to use to fight Google's monopoly on rendering engines, and I use almost no extensions apart from the Nextcloud password manager, an ad and tracker blocker, which is uBlock Origin, and the Ecosia search extension. For my office suite, I use LibreOffice. Everyone knows about it, it's great for my needs, especially with the tabbed interface, it looks decent on GNOME, and it does all I need from it. Although, admittedly, that's not much. Because I don't work. Well, I do work, I make these videos, but I don't work in an office, I don't need to exchange documents back and forth with other people, so compatibility is very low on my list of priorities. So LibreOffice has all the features that I actually need. For email and calendar, I moved to Thunderbird, seeing as version 115 is absolutely wonderful and very well designed. I switched it to Cards View for more legibility, I went to a lower information density, and I removed all the buttons I didn't need from the header bar. And I also hid most of the panels that I didn't need. I applied this Libadvita theme that makes Thunderbird blend a lot more in my desktop environment as well. I'm still waiting for the sync features to land to actually use tags and filters because I don't want to have to do this on every computer I use. Look, I'm not recreating all my filters on two different computers and recreating and retagging every email on two different computers. I do YouTube, which should tell you that I don't really like to work. I plugged my Nextcloud account in there so I get all my calendars and contacts synced on every device and my email address is provided by the registrar for my website. And so that's about it for all the open source software I run on a daily basis. There are a bunch of smaller utilities that I use very infrequently to help me do a few things like manage PDF documents or convert other file formats, but on a day-to-day -day basis these are all the things that I use. And I also use today's sponsors' devices on a daily basis. Tuxedo is a Linux hardware manufacturer, which means that they create laptops, desktops, NUX, and whatever else that runs Linux out of the box. The hardware is specifically picked to run well with Linux, and if there are a few incompatibilities, they actually submit patches upstream 
to fix all of those. They have a wide range of devices that should cover basically every need and every price point, whether you're looking for a small affordable ultrabook or a very high-end workstation or a gaming laptop, a tower, a NUC, whatever they have. it. They have a bunch of customization options for all the components, but also for your own logo or for your own keyboard layout on your laptop. All their laptops are also openable, repairable, and upgradable, including the RAM, the SSD, the battery, and sometimes even the wireless card. So if you need a new computer, stop supporting manufacturers that don't support Linux. Start supporting manufacturers that actually contribute to Linux's growth. Click the link in the description below and buy yourself a Tuxedo PC. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, or to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, there's that down facing thumbs down button. And you can also tell me why you didn't like the video in the comments down below. And if you really enjoy what I do, it's easy to support the channel. You can just click any of the links in the description for LibraPay, PayPal, Patreon, YouTube thanks, YouTube memberships. You know how this works. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.